This week on ANN, new opportunities for small farmers in Taiwan. Responding in the wake of Russia's worst flooding in more than a century. And sharing a message of hope through community outreach in Brazil. These stories and more coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, an Adventist charity in Taiwan is bringing new opportunities to small farmers in the country. Through training and technology, the Taiwan Adventist Foundation is helping indigenous farmers reach consumers directly. Executive Officer Jane Lin says the foundation helps farmers bypass large agricultural corporations by growing organic produce and selling at outdoor markets. Lynn helps farmers post pictures of their crops on Pinterest, an online photo sharing website. Social networks are helping the farmers create demand for their produce and earn better pay, leading to a higher standard of living and healthier communities. Adventist humanitarians in Russia are raising funds in churches across the region to support victims of the country's worst flooding in more than a century. 30,000 people evacuated Russia's Far East when the Amur River overflowed its banks last month. Now, more than 40 towns are completely flooded, affecting more than 100,000 people. Some are living in temporary shelters, while others have stayed behind to wait out the flood in attics and upper floors. Emergency workers are bringing stranded families food and water by boat. The disaster is particularly bad news for local farmers. Flooding destroyed more than half of the region's farmland just before autumn harvest. Aid workers are also concerned about the approaching winter season, which may leave thousands of families without permanent shelter during the coldest months. Adventist women in Inter-America say they're committed to sharing God's love in major cities in the region. Adventist World Church Women's Ministries Director Heather Dawn Small told women at a recent conference to leave their Bibles at home and hit the streets ready to work. Christ's method of outreach, she said, is more than a Bible study. It involves reaching people where they hurt with a practical message of hope and healing. The challenge came during a women's ministries convention that drew hundreds of women leaders from across the church's inter-American region to Miami. Organizers recognized the achievements of women leaders, offered training seminars, and networking opportunities for attendees. Adventist women at the convention pledged to help bring 40,000 new members into the church by the end of the year. The Adventist Church in Brazil is planning a wide-scale outreach project in the capital city of Brasilia this month. Called Capital of Hope, the project will include mass blood donations, roadside and park cleanup, food distribution, and support for neighborhoods where drug addiction is a growing problem. The week-long project will also offer nightly spiritual messages by Adventist evangelist Luis Gonsalves and other pastors. Organizers say the event will help church members connect with their neighbors by demonstrating the practical side of Christianity. The project begins this weekend and runs until September 22. All 917 Adventist schools in North America will receive a documentary celebrating intelligent design just in time for Creation Sabbath next month. The Illustra Media documentary, Metamorphosis, The Beauty and Design of Butterflies, illustrates the transformation from a caterpillar to butterfly, a process that evolution struggles to explain. Using magnetic resonance imaging scans, the film creates the first 3D computer animated depiction of metamorphosis. The film also follows the migration of monarch butterflies from as far north as Canada to their wintering grounds in Mexico. U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama said last week that her anti-childhood obesity campaign is changing how Americans live and eat. With support from faith and community groups, the Let's Move initiative is encouraging exercise and increasing access to healthy food. One of those faith groups is Adventists In Step for Life. The Adventist Initiative encourages church members to log two million collective miles of physical activity every year. It also focuses on nutrition by helping to launch community gardens and summer meal programs for needy children. This year, In Step for Life will host the third annual Let's Move Day on September 22. Earlier today, I sat down with Katya Reinhardt to learn more about this year's event. Thanks for joining us, Katya. My pleasure. What are some of the major events planned for Let's Move Day this year? Well, this year we're going to have one of the flagship events. It's going to be in Indianapolis, for instance. We're going to have a 5K uh, Let's Move Day there, and there's a lot of excitement. They are partnering the many other institutions in the community. There will be a Kids Health Expo. There will be um, 
uh, an adult health expo. There will be many other uh, screenings being done and lots of excitement uh, on Let's Move Day in Indianapolis. So that's one of the flagship events where uh, lots of officials are coming, the NAD leadership and others will be there. You're making a big effort this year to get young people excited about yes. exercise. Tell us about the incentive for Pathfinder clubs in North America who participate. So we have uh, come together with the youth ministries um, and we are offering an award for clubs, Pathfinder clubs that will have the most participation rates throughout the year from January to December and also the most miles. Um, so we're going to be giving $1,000 for all the 10 top clubs that have the most participation rates, most miles, and we're going to be awarding them at Oshkosh next year, you know, the big campery. Uh, and so we're looking forward to recognizing those clubs that uh, are going to be participating, really exciting, uh, recording all their miles. They just need to go on the website to register and uh, they will compete for those awards. You're also planning a webinar this year. Um, is that something our viewers can attend? Yes, we have webinars almost every month, as a matter of fact. So now that we're getting ready for Let's Move Day, uh, we're going to have our last webinar right before Let's Move Day, which is, by the way, September 22nd, right? So the webinar will be on September 17th. And, and people can sign up online when, if they go to www.adventistsinstepforlife.org. They can just sign up. It's a free webinar and they can learn everything they need to, to know to register uh, their miles, to report um, how they're doing and, you know, what people are doing on Let's Move Day and throughout the year as well. But particularly, we're going to focus on Let's Move Day. And so Pathfinders can learn what they need to do. Adults, children, everybody can see how to use the website, how to report their miles and get credit for, you know, the physical activity that they do. Thanks, Katya. My pleasure. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So many ways to experience the Bible. I found it really interesting that the record, the scriptural record, talks about God speaking the universe into existence, but it specifically uses the word formed. And I, when I first paid attention to that, I realized that God was sculpting. He was the first sculptor on this earth, and he didn't just sculpt the outside, he sculpted every nerve cell, every you know, every component of the body as he went along. So I, I'm totally inspired by the fact that God saw fit to bend down to the earth and use the clay that I now use or some form similar to it. Lovingly formed every aspect of it and thought about it and decided this is what I want, this is how I want it done. And that's, what, what, that's kind of what I do and it's, that connection is just awesome. Welcome back. A project of the Revival and Reformation Initiative is a website that shares stories of people whose prayers have been answered. It's called Answered.tv. This week we share one of their stories. I was born in Romania during communism and the school system operated on a six day a week. Because I was a Sabbath-keeping Christian, I never went to school on Saturday. In first grade, when I was six years old, all the way to fourth grade, by the time I was nine, the professor decided that he wouldn't want me to get the homework that was given out on Saturday and do Monday. During communism, corporal punishment, it was just the thing to do. If I didn't have that homework Monday morning, I would be punished physically, emotionally, and really for a six-year-old, that was torture. That meant I have to put my hands out, and I would get so many hits on my hands that instead of having the dip, it was puffing out. Other days, he would resort to 
putting me in a corner and have me kneel on rice, corn pebbles, uh, nutshells. And during this whole time, I would have my arms above my head, holding all my books, my backpack, whatever he could find that was heavy enough and figured that I would give in. I started praying and after I, I finished my prayer, a thought came that, well, there's one student that I didn't go to and I should go there. I walked to her house, knocked on the door, and when she opened, she immediately pulled me in and shut the door. And she knew exactly what I was why I was there for. She said, I figured you would come, and I decided I will give you the homework. But you can't come during light while there's daylight. You have to come after sunsets. During communism, there were no street lights. Dogs were not pets. They were outside running loose. So that's where it began. First grade, every Sunday night, I would walk over to her house after sunset and get the homework. But every Sunday, I would pray that God would keep me safe and keep me safe on the streets while I would walk three miles one way and get the homework. My name is Adrian and my prayer was answered. We have another installment this week of our ongoing series on the Adventist Church's history and development. Danya Aragon reports from the birthplace of the church in the U.S. state of Michigan. Core values such as freedom and independence were predominant in the establishment of the United States as a nation as well as in the structuring of religious movements, such as Adventism. America's revolution in the late 18th century implanted this idea of being suspicious of monarchies, of emperors, of powers, of higher authorities in ecclesiastical organizations or in government. And so Americans who were attracted to Adventism were also suspicious of organizations that exercised heavy top-down control. By the time that the Adventist Review began publishing, a discussion sprang up within a few years about whether we needed even some form of church organization. Many, many of the Review readers said, absolutely not. Why were they opposed? Well, they had just come out of the Millerite movement. And in the Millerite movement, their belief in the soon coming of Jesus has caused the normal churches, the regular churches, Methodists, you know, Baptists, Christian Connection, whoever it might be, to reject them. And so they, those were churches, they thought, that had a creed and were, were formal and like Babylon. Porque no início de 1844, George Storrs diz que nenhuma igreja pode ser organizada por vontade humana sem que se torne Babilônia no momento de sua organização. Então havia uma resistência a qualquer forma de organização e até mesmo a escolha de um nome. But James White said no. And Ellen White said, no, no, this is different. We're organizing with a mission. Once it became clear to our church, and uh, our prophet Ellen White was invaluable in guiding the churches, once it became clear that we had a global responsibility in mission, that we had to take this around the world, it also became clear to us that we must have an organization which is equally global. Because we have to hold together, we have to keep, we have to be sure that we stay as one family. So why did we organize? This is a question people have asked. What caused us to organize? Well, uh, it was James White, really, who was much the leader in this. And it really is a convergence of, of issues. Uh, perhaps the immediate issue was the publishing work. A nossa editora estava em nome de Tiago White. E se ele morresse, o que, que aconteceria? Então ele queria colocar isso em nome da igreja. 
Só que para colocar em nome da igreja, não tem como registrar uma editora em uma igreja sem nome. Então, foi exatamente o fato de nós organizarmos a obra de publicações, ou mais especificamente a nossa editora, que levou à escolha de um nome, que forçou esse processo e que acabou ocorrendo no dia 1 de outubro de 1860. The other issues that were affecting us were the rapidly approaching civil war. And of course, as we moved into the civil war, the need to organize made it possible for us to represent the church. And then a third thing was the group was big enough. There were so many ministers. At first, James White was just passing money to people, saying, well, you need some money, here's some money. But he couldn't get money to all the right people. And so there were people who were hungry and their families were hungry. They didn't have a system to make it work. The need for a structure that would direct the movement in an organized way became not only evident, but urgent. A university in Africa added a stewardship course to its Master of Business program. Larry Evans just returned from the Adventist University of Africa in Kenya and has this update. Countries around the world have been rocked by financial scandals. Protesters have filled streets with placards of disgust. Greed, says Paul in Colossians 3.5, is the modern day idolatry. We must raise our voices, and having brilliant minds without a moral compass is indeed a disaster waiting to happen. Well, you can imagine how pleased we were with the invitation to teach a course in stewardship for the Masters in Business Administration program. The Adventist uh, University of Africa, located in Kenya, is the first and only MBA program in the denomination to have a course in stewardship as part of its core curriculum. 25 students were in the class and all were either conference mission treasurers, accountants, or auditors. Pastor William Bagambi, Division Stewardship and Trust Service Director and I, taught the class. Our presentations covered such topics as biblical foundations for stewardship, tithe and offerings as part of a trust relationship, stewardship and the moral crisis of our age, family budgeting, and children as stewards, to name only a few of the topics. It was certainly a stimulating experience for us, but it seemed that way for the students as well. It's important that as we train the minds to lead the financial institutions of our church, that we also equip them with God's counsel about biblical stewardship. Still ahead, Adventist schools in Panama are shaping the community. But up next, we have a preview of the September lineup on Hope Channel. I pray, I pray for the for the people um, for the people that are poor and don't have any homes or no food at all in the streets. I pray for people to be safe. I pray that a lot of things in the world would be fair. I pray for um, homeless people. Um, I pray that I do a good job in school. As I read through The Great Hope, there was a phrase that really caught my attention and it was speaking about Martin Luther where he relates his own painful experience in vainly seeking by humiliation and penance to secure salvation and assured his hearers that it was by looking away from himself and believing in Christ that he found peace and joy. And I really believe that so many of us in our lives, we look for that peace and joy and we think that it's by our own works or that, um, that we can work for salvation in our own merits, but it's really by looking at Christ's blood that we can then finally find that peace in our hearts. And I think Martin Luther's life is a good reflection of how we all need to come to really look at Jesus and the cross before we can actually have peace in our hearts. Welcome back. The September lineup on Hope Channel includes old favorites and some new specials. Carmen McMurdy has a preview of the upcoming season. Hope Channel's new season is here, and what a lineup we have! In Cross Connection, Oleg and Sergio will explore the Gospel of John with some exciting new twists and turns. If you enjoy the segment Jesus Lives, you will definitely like their new segment called Hidden Treasures. 
Let's Pray is adding more phone lines to be better prepared for your calls. We want to be sure that you truly don't have to pray alone. Go Healthy for Good will have a week-long series on topics such as brain health, lifestyle medicine, longevity, and addictions. But that's not all. Besides our signature shows, we have other special programs planned for you. One is Mark Finley's series on the themes of Revelation, and the other is a new series by David Asherick. His presentations will have you examining the role of God both in the bigger scheme of things and in the finite moments of your life. Find out more about our new season at HopeTV.org. For Hope Channel, I'm Carmen McMurdy. A USB hard drive adapter can help you recover documents on a computer or external drive that won't start up. John Beckett explains on this week's Tech Corner. Every once in a while, a computer or an external drive won't start. And often, it's not actually the drive that has failed. In these cases, it's pretty easy to save your documents. And today, I'm going to share how the techies do that. But be warned, what I'm going to show will probably void your warranty. First, a bit of background. The hard drive is actually a piece where the computer stores your information permanently. Laptops, desktops, and external drives almost always contain drives that are very similar. For instance, most USB drives simply contain a PC drive plus a piece that lets them connect using a cable. To attempt to pull documents off a failed laptop or desktop drive, first Google search for how to open up the broken device. And here we have a sample broken device. And we're going to open it up and we're going to pull out its drive. When you get inside, you'll find something that looks a bit like this. If it's a desktop, it may be a little bit bigger. So we pull out the drive and then we set aside the broken device. Now we need what's called a USB to SATA or IDE adapter. And what it is, uh, you can get this on Amazon.com, probably about $20. Uh, don't get just the cheapest one you can find, get one with good reviews. What it is, is on the one end it has the USB connector, and on the other end it has a variety of connectors that will plug into lots of different sorts of drives. So you get this thing and you read the little book for how to use it. Uh, usually you start with the power unplugged. And then you just snap in the drive to the connector that it fits. Like that. Make sure that the thing is turned off and plug in the power for it. Now we need our rescue computer. If you think a virus killed your device, then you may want to make sure that the antivirus software is up to date. And so we plug in plug in the USB end of the adapter to the computer and then we turn it on. And in just a few seconds you'll see on your desktop uh, your drive mounted, uh, much like you would an external thumb drive or something like that. You can dig through it and pull off the documents that you need to save. Anyway, that's how techies often will save the documents off something that has failed and you can do it too uh, without a lot of difficulty. Hope this helps you. Maranatha Volunteers International raises awareness and funds for hundreds of building projects and mobilizes volunteers to make those projects a reality. This year, the supporting ministry is meeting a growing need for schools. In 2013, Maranatha is making a significant push to meet the growing need for more schools. More than 170 classrooms and a dozen school buildings have been planned for this year in nine countries. Recently, Ella Simmons, General Vice President of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church, went to Panama, where Maranatha is building a school in Santiago. Dr. Simmons visited several churches and schools constructed by volunteers, including Concepcion Adventist School, which was built in 1996. Nearly 20 years later, the school is flourishing with 434 students. It is the largest Adventist primary school in South Central America. Our schools are for children and our schools are for entire families. So the parents are expected to be involved in ways that they can. And in doing so, typically, parents even become better parents. Grandparents are involved. Church members who do not have children are often involved. All goes in to Seventh-day Adventist education with the expected outcome of highest, the highest of academic standards and spiritual faithfulness. Maranatha has been responding to the need for schools with two types of buildings. The Education and Evangelism Center is a multi-classroom block building with a central meeting space. 
Maranatha also builds one-day schools, a campus comprised of several individual classrooms. Adventist World Church President Ted Wilson is inviting viewers to accept God's many gifts. This week's gift is the Comforter, God's Holy Spirit. As Jesus came up out of the water from his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and rested upon him. To help his church and his followers, including you and me, Jesus promised a Comforter who would always be with us. That's the Holy Spirit the third member of the Godhead who renews and transforms us into the image of God. He empowers God's church to fulfill its mission of preaching, teaching, and making more disciples for the kingdom of God. He is the one who inspired the Word of God and who gives us understanding as we read His precious Word. We are not alone. There is a living presence who walks with us and is able to help if we only ask. Accept the gift of God's Holy Spirit and let Him shape your life. Now let's turn to Benjamin Baker for a look at Adventist history. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On September 11, 2001, two airplanes struck the Twin Towers in Manhattan, New York City, killing some 3,000 people and injuring many more. The Adventist response was quick. Adventist Community Services, or ACS, was allowed access to Ground Zero and provided victims and their families food, water, clothing, and money, as well as spiritual and emotional care. The National Association for the Prevention of Starvation, or NAPS, of Oakwood University sent vans filled with students to help out in any way they could. Other Adventist organizations pitched in. Indeed, Adventists have a long history of humanitarian assistance in the wake of crises. Our missionaries provided medical care and housing in China after the flood of 1931. Housing and food were provided after the Huascaran avalanche of 1970 in Peru. ADRA greatly helped after the 1991 Bangladesh cyclone. News channels flashed ACS's contact information after Hurricane Andrew in 1992. The displaced were taken in by church members after the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004. In 2005, while Hurricane Katrina was still pounding the Gulf Coast, ACS was on hand and later led out in community rebuilding projects, restoring over 250 homes. ADRA has been cited for their work in alleviating and preventing the spreads of AIDS. The Haiti earthquake of 2010 witnessed thousands of members ministering to those ravaged. And all of this our church seeks to show the compassion and love of Jesus Christ. And that was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church. In the meantime, find us on Facebook. You can connect with other Adventists worldwide and find links to more stories, photos, and videos. Just visit Facebook slash Adventist News. Our good news for this week comes from the New Testament book of First Peter. The passage says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.